thank you everyone for coming. Uh, it's great to be here in Waco. Uh, welcome to our Mahler Hour, or specifically our event focusing on one of Mahler's greatest song sets. I should probably introduce our cast of characters here. I'm Arvid Ashby from the musicology area at The Ohio State University. Our soprano is Kimberly, your own, Baylor's own Kimberly Monson. And our pianist is Jiung Yoon. Uh, Jiung and I are both coming in from Ohio. And actually, we knew Kimberly uh, when she was in the graduate program in the School of Music uh, there. She's an old friend. And I just, it's wonderful that you, you have her as a resource and have her, have her in your midst. So, uh, so it's great to be here with that. So first of all, a shameless plug on my part. Uh, these thoughts, these ideas on Mahler's Rickert songs are really developed from and, and excerpted from this magnificent volume, uh, which uh, appeared in 2020, Experiencing Mahler, a Listener's Companion, Roman and Littlefield. It's easily available. Uh, makes a great birthday gift. Uh, <laughs> go out and, and buy a copy. I'll make 10 cents. Buy, buy a copy for all your friends. Um, so it's largely out of this uh, project of kind of thinking about Mahler's output uh, as a whole that many of these uh, thoughts emanated that we're going to be presenting here tonight. So Gustav Mahler lived from 1860 to 1911 and is known really primarily for his all-embracing symphonies. Visionary and often long works imbued with grandeur, with realism, and occasionally with chaos. But songwriting came earlier and more naturally to Mahler. In cultivating this pluralism of symphonies and songs, Mahler showed an unlikely knack for both long and short musical spans, for blatancy of effect and subtlety of touch. Now, what are the genre differences between song and symphony? The German art song, the Lied, is a short and usually quite simple work with words, an accompanied setting of lyric poetry for one singer. It's a musical version of poetic introspection. The composer helps us on his or her own terms to eavesdrop on the poet's thoughts. Often a simple melody serves both as the invitation to listen and as a musical translation of the poem's broader meaning. Now, a quintessential example of such a, a simple uh, a lyric lead would be Schumann's two-minute setting of Heinrich Heine's uh, simple two-stanza verse, Du bist wie eine Blume, uh, which Schumann uh, published as part of his uh, Myrten, Opus 25, in 1840. Here, Heine's text begins in translation, of course, you are like a flower, so sweet and fair and pure, I look at you and sadness steals into my heart. The poetic simile here couldn't be simpler, right? You have the beloved, the beloved is like a flower, though the emotions uh, themselves prove rather deceptive. Now the genre of the symphony, on the other hand, is an extended orchestral piece that speaks to the august history of so-called absolute music, meaning abstract, instrumental composition, uh, supposedly without reference to stories, words, or pictures. The symphony is also very much a public forum for public thoughts, designed as a civil, civic vehicle for grand statements. Here a prime example would be uh, Beethoven's Eroica Symphony, timing at 50 minutes, or maybe the same composer's uh, more typically driven symphony number no. five. With Mahler, uniquely and fascinatingly, there are basic organic common roots between these divergent song and symphony projects. Musicologist Knud Mottner actually contends in his recent book, Mahler's Concerts, that Mahler's symphonic compositional trajectory really didn't begin until 1887, when Mahler was 26, specifically with his free completion of Carl Maria von Weber's unfinished opera, Die Drei Pintos. Using an, an archive of pre-existing material, namely Carl Maria von Weber's uh, uh, drafts and sketches, using this as the basis for an extended new work, uh, Mahler ended up uh, discovering the possibility of doing something similar with his own songs. So, and this he did. Uh, so symphonic composition thereby became a kind of archeological dig for Mahler. 
Especially up until 1900, his songwriting became inseparable from his symphonic writing. The lyrical from the developmental and the beauties of the moment from the necessities of the wide expanse. Mahler wrote 11 symphonies. He was a very busy man. Unbelievable that he uh, was able. That was, and, and that wasn't his day job, as you, as you might know. His day job was conducting. Mahler wrote 11 symphonies, if we count Das Lied von der Erde and the Unfinished Tenth Symphony. And he also wrote four main song collections, which I've given for you up here. The largest such collection, spanning his late 20s through his late 30s, is Des Knaben Wunderhorn, the youth's magic horn, a sizable song compilation from which he continued to peel off individual songs for direct transplantation into his second, third, and fourth symphonies. Uh, so a kind of process of recycling earlier material that uh, Martiner mentioned. Additionally, Mahler wrote three shorter song sets uh, that are particularly prized by singers and listeners alike for their uncontrived vocal writing and their jewel-like encapsulations of emotion. These sets are the leader, Eines Fahnen and Gesellen, the songs of a wayfarer from 83 to 85, including some of his earliest uh, preserved efforts. The Rickert leader, uh, songs to text by Friedrich Rickert, written uh, 1901 to 1902. Those are the songs we're talking about tonight. And the Kinder Totenlieder, or Children's Dirges, from 1901 to 1904. These three shorter leader groups show Mahler limiting himself to a single singing voice and to traditional poetry at pivotal points in his compositional career. He actually wasn't an adventurous uh, composer in terms of his uh, song text choices, compared at least with many of his contemporaries, including his old conservatory roommate Hugo Wolf a great songwriter unto himself. For the Wayfarer group, Mahler compiled 12 of his earliest adult compositions, all of them settings of his own idealized romantic folkloric verses. The Rickert leader and Kinder Totten leader show him finding renewed inspiration in lyric poetry at a later juncture. So as a fledgling composer in his 20s, and uh, this character just really uh, captured Mahler's intensity of facial expression quite, quite well here. As a fledgling composer in his 20s, Mahler was especially drawn to the collection of texts that Achim von Arnim and Clemens Brentano had published in 1805 and 1808 under this title, Des Knaben Wunderhorn Alte Deutsche Lieder, or The Youth's Magic Horn Old German Songs. The charm and the morbid grotesquerie of these olden style folkloric poems proved deeply influential on all of Mahler's music up until about 1901. These songs deal in sharp character archetypes and vividly dramatic scenarios. The Knaben Wunderhorn texts are as much character study, sketches of doomed soldiers, starving children, das irdische Leben, uh, yearning lovers, wandering pilgrims, uh, characters like this, as well as actions and emotions. Now, as a prime example of this earlier Mahler in this kind of epic narrative mode, let's take the last of his Knaben von Orhan songs in the 1901 edition, namely Der Tamburg Zell uh, from this Knaben von Orhan. Now, in this particular lead, Mahler tells the drummer boy's sad story of farewell after he is captured by the enemy and condemned. So this is a, a very bitter fate indeed. The ill-fated lad narrates being led to his own execution. Uh, the text beginning, I, poor drummer boy, they're leading me from my cell. If I'd remained a drummer, I would not be imprisoned. O gallows, you lofty home, you look so fearsome, I won't look at you any longer because I know I am yours. So actually gazing at his place of execution, this is pretty heady, dramatic stuff. So this song plays out in action, uh, the boy's motion out of the jail to the scaffolding, but it's also more abstractly a study in fate, helplessness, and subjugation. So let's hear Kimberly and Jung now do this opening of Tambo Gzell to give you an idea of these Knaben Wunderhorn mini dramas, the, the earlier Mahler, with the harrowing portrayals of death and 
despair and insistence that we stand in the shoes of grotesque, ill-fated, or satirical characters. We'll hear the whole, uh, uh, well, we'll hear uh, the Rickard song coming up in a moment. So this is very dark, dark stuff. Um, it reminds me of one of the most famous biographical uh, anecdotes about Mahler as a child that someone, a family friend, asked him when he was six years old what he wanted to be grown, when he grew up, and his answer was a martyr. So <laughs> this almost uh, connoisseurship of suffering uh, you, can, you can actually hear in a song like this. So this song has the kind of dark bitterness that's only possible with a first person character acting out a drama. As Mahler approached uh, the turn of the century, he actually began to abandon narrative epic style poems of this kind uh, and dramatic musical illustrations and also distance himself from such early romantic folklore style stories which centered on piquant characters you could find on the street, the barracks, or in the tavern. Instead, Mahler at this juncture uh, in his 40th year turned to the lyric poetry of the German poet and orientalist Friedrich Rickert, starting in 1901 with his beautiful song sets of the Rickert leader and the Kinder Toten leader. Now, these big compositional shifts correlated with real life changes for Mahler. 1901 was a pivotal year for him. At the Opera House in Vienna, where he was music director, Mahler began his visionary, visual, visionary collaboration with designer director Alfred Roller, a collaboration that has gone down in the history of staged opera as arguably the start of modern opera production history. Mahler also suffered a life-threatening hemorrhage, which required emergency surgery and a long convalescence. He built a beautiful summer home near the Corinthian Alps, and he then married Alma Schindler and started a family. So a very, very eventful year in which he made this stylistic change. Scholars have referenced this epical year 1901 in dividing Mahler's symphonic output into two halves. Importantly for our discussion tonight, this paradigm shift between the fourth and fifth symphonies and between the earlier songs and the later leader follows a basic change in Mahler's taste in poetry. The important word here is lyric. Now, one statement uh, that is meaningful, I believe very meaningful, came from a conversation uh, Mahler had with the young composer Anton Weber, one of Arnold Schoenberg's students. And in this statement, Mahler called Rickert's poetry a quintessential example of lyric poetry. And here are Mahler's own words. He said to Webern, after des Knaben Wunderhorn, all I could do was Rickert. It's first hand lyric poetry. Everything else is second hand lyric poetry. So in this turn to lyric texts, this composer was aligning himself with a certain kind of experience and a certain form of musical world making. So what does the word lyric mean exactly as a term that Mahler chose to emphasize so strongly and as a kind of poetry that Rickert embodied so consummately? The word has a long history. We can go back to Aristotle. Aristotle differentiated between epic, dramatic, and lyric forms of poetry. 
epic poetry, storytellers telling lengthy tales of the past, dramatic poetry, characters acting out their own involvements in the present, lyric poetry, uh, first person self poetry that describes a subjective sphere of experience. So lyric poems don't involve folkloric storytelling, explicit imagery, or stagey drama. What they really do quintessentially is frame a short expanse of language in a way that showcases the beauty inherent in human feeling. Lyric poems frame lovely rather than characteristic emotions, and in doing so, invite us to empathize with universal unnamed characters. We heard part of the Wunderhorn lead Tambor Gazelle just a few moments ago, that very dark opening. The narration, the delivery, and the dark imagery here contrast strongly with, to pick a late lyric example, Ich bin der Welt abhanden gekommen, I am lost to the world. And this is one of the Rickert leader we're talking about tonight. This is undoubtedly the most personal of Mahler's later Rickert songs, perhaps of all of his songwriting. And it brazenly declares that subjective mindset, which is a rather paradoxical thing to do, right from the opening lines. I am lost to the world with which I used to waste much time. It has for so long been, for so long known nothing of me. It may well believe that I am dead. So this is uh, an absolute retreat from the world. So once again, the contrast is between narrative epic styles of setting, which look outward into the world out there, and lyric poetic styles, which look inward into subjectivity and the heart and the mind. The Ich bin der Welt uh, text is an example of lyric poetry that actually has no subject. I mean, how lyric can you get? It broaches nothing other than the subject of pure subjectivity. As Mollo suggested, this poetry is solely and essentially lyric. It tells no tales, describes no past chivalries. It offers no lessons. It invokes no sense of time. It introduces no characters. Just who is this anonymous and sexless first person descriptor of the retreating self? Knowing the answer would get in the way of the song's message, or as is more likely, the narrator's anonymity is part, a major part of the message. Mahler's settings of Friedrich Rückert's first class lyric poetry in his Rückert leader don't constitute a song cycle in the usual integral unified sense. Half of these poems are in an early romantic, even naive style that suggests Schumann setting Heinrich Heine at his simplest. One such song from the Rückert group here is Blicke mir nicht in die Lieder, Do Not Look Into My Songs, a lead that thematizes creation while also urging attention away from the author's song. So there's really a bit of passive aggressiveness going on here. Uh, at least trying to not have the songs looked at until they are finished. So Mahler takes this strange Rooker text about creativity and paranoia and gives it actually a charming spin. The title line translate, translates most directly as do not look at my songs or into my songs, but actually is better read as do not look at me through my songs, which accurately renders, more accurately renders the implicit warning not to confuse author and work. The last line of the first stanza suggests the author is serious, very serious, and wanting to avoid scrutiny. Deine Neugier ist verrat, your curiosity is treason, it says. Now, it would be easy to imagine a dark, mistrustful setting of this verse, but Mahler's rendition shows a gift for lighthearted humor. He adds a layer of self-ridicule to Rückert's nervous self-effacement. The song begins with a busy accompanimental passage suggesting both coyness and needless toil, or uh, as an idea that Jung came up with when I was talking with him about the song, or maybe it's suggesting the bees that Rickert mentions in stanza two. Uh, bees, when they build cells, let no one watch either, and do not even watch themselves when the rich honeycombs, etc. In any event, Mahler's near rigidity of rhythm hints at obsessiveness of some kind. 
The pauses in the vocal line tend to be awkward and abrupt. Is the person out of breath from labor and worry over writing songs? Or is the rhythm incompetently composed, or perhaps both? So I suggest you hear Blick and Mier nicht in die Lieder in terms of these uh, self-contradictions. Hear the charming perk of the melodic line, which undercuts uh, Rickert's verbal suspicions. Enjoy the slightly pale, gemütlich romanticism of the style, which is opposed by the rather gawky rhythmic vocabulary. And here I'll point out uh, the stabbing, recurrent stresses on beat two and cut time. And lastly, I would suggest you savor Mahler's use of subtle repetition in invoking a subtle mania. So now uh, Kimberly and Jung will perform Blicke mir nicht in die Lieder. Something ironic there, the, the song of the set that uh, talks about the references. Songwriting is also the shortest song of the set. Kind of a strange situation. So if Blickemir demonstrates Mahler subverting normative songfulness, he sets the more conventional verse, Ich atmet einen Linden duft, to a swaying, hovering vocal line, largely in 6 4 time, that manages to be both a memorable lyrical idea and an evocative representation of the poem's gentle fragrance wafting through the air. The constant eighth notes in the pianist's right hand, uh, given to violins in Mahler's orchestral version, is the thread that weaves its way through the entire song, representing perhaps the poet's sensory vigilance. There is a considerable feat here, I hope you'll appreciate, in the way he's musicalized an olfactory sense experience. That's a difficult connection to make between the, uh, between, uh, the nose and the sense of, of musicality and the ears. To prep us here, actually, the song even starts with a gentle aromatic, aromatic spray in the treble of the piano.
There's no set order for the five Rickert leader. No one single order of them can be definitive or even actually satisfying, as Mahler himself must have recognized. Blickemir, which you just heard uh, a moment ago, makes a good starting point since, as I say, it shows the songwriter in the act of creation. That's one reason we started with it tonight. The two shorter songs, Ich Achmet eine Linden Duft, which you just heard, and Liebst du um Schönheit, which will follow in a moment, these deal in slighter emotions uh, than the others, meaning they work best as interior to the sequence. So this is our order here, our chosen order uh, on the screen. Kimberly Jung and I have elected here to end with Ich bin der Welt, abhanden gekommen, since it is by general agreement perhaps Mahler's greatest song of all. And yet the act of absconding described in Ich bin der Welt makes it a difficult song to follow up on. And its final cadence is so much more graceful than definitive that an audience might not want to applaud. So we're ending with Ich bin der Welt, but uh, we could imagine it uh, possibly appearing elsewhere in the sequence. And actually, a good rendering of this last song transports the listener, at least this listener, so far away from the world's tumult that hearing any kind of music after it can be almost painful. So as you can see, we placed Um Mitternacht at the center. This song is perhaps the strangest of the five. It's a mystical nocturnal ritual and host the most dramatic progression of all from B minor and bare textures and low registers to a blazing B major, which in the orchestration is full of uh, brass instruments. So it makes the best closer, it would make the best closer uh, to a set of the five uh, for several reasons, but the processional style really makes it unique. So it stands away and wouldn't be a good ender for that reason. Rupert here invokes midnight, Mitternacht, as a time of revelation, of secret things revealed while the world sleeps. Much as Friedrich Nietzsche would later write uh, a midnight song in his Alza Sprach Zarathustra, actually a text that Mahler set as the fourth movement of his third symphony. Nietzsche's text here, quite close to Rupert's in several ways, says in translation, Oh, humanity, take heed. What does deep midnight say? The world is deep, deeper than the day imagined. And then later in Nietzsche, deep, deep is its woe, which is an attestation uh, that's actually similar to Rickert's at midnight, I fought the battle, O oh, mankind of your affliction. So there's kind of a spiritual battle that becomes involved. But Rupert diverges from Nietzsche here in actually arriving at a kind of religious uh, 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 invocation. The speaker gives himself or herself uh, up to the Lord at the end. Herr über Tod und Leben, du hältst die Wacht um Mitternacht. Lord, over life and death, thou keepest watch at midnight. So Mahler manages to pull a lyrical vocal line from Rickert's poem and in his orchestration, no strings involved at all, entirely has the uh, scoring for winds, brass, harp, and piano, and in that motion traces a progression in coloration from darkness to bright, glorious splendor. So Kimberly and Jung will now perform Um Mitternacht for us.
Thank you. Our next song of the group, second to the last, Liebstuhm Schönheit, must count as the most coy lead ever written. It's also, by the way, the second shortest of the set after Blickemir nicht in Deliter. So Liebstuhm Schönheit is, uh, note how strange it is, a methodical ticking off of reasons not to love the author. Don't love me if you love for beauty. Don't love me if you love for youth. Don't love me if you love for wealth, none of which I have. But yes, as the conclusion comes here, but yes, please love me if you love for the sake of love alone because I am rich in love. This Rueckert poem is strophic in a way that highlights its conventional nature as a love song. Here, each possible reason for love or not loving is methodically given the same music. So Mahler is basically making clear that this is a list. This text is a list of things. Clara Vick Schumann, uh, Robert's wife, set the same text to music in 1841 in a song that you'll sometimes hear that follows earlier, more generalized and formulaic notions of strophic text setting. Mahler differs from Clara Schumann in aiming much more intently for the punchline in the last stanza, namely the changeover from the threefold O oh, nicht mich liebe to this final O oh, ja mich liebe. So uh, now uh, Kimberly and Jung will perform Liebste um Schönheit for us.
we move on now to the fifth and last song of the Rupert Theater. Earlier on, I'd already mentioned the song. Earlier on, you heard me contrast uh, the earlier Knaben Wunderhorn song in epic narrative style, Der Tambour Gazelle, with his later Rückert lead in lyric style, Ich bin der Welt abhanden gekommen. We'll hear that song in its entirety now. The earlier song and this later song are very different in tone. As you'll remember, Tambour Gazelle begins with a dark military march. Uh, in Mahler's orchestration of the song, he gives uh, these march rhythms to snare drum and low woodwinds. So it's a very dark, uh, almost funereal sound. This is a clear emotional perspective in that earlier song that Mahler marks measured and muffled, gemessen duf. The vocal line itself in that earlier song, I, poor drummer boy, they're leading me from my cell, is basic and quite narrow in range, a clear presentation of a particular character. By contrast, Ich bin der Welt abhanden gekommen offers a remarkable mix of simplicity and elusiveness. The voice part here is a model of austerity. The song takes only three or four notes, and hesitant notes at that, to captivate the listener. We first hear a single isolated pitch, a low C, something between a gentle call to attention and a loving tap on the, so on the shoulder. Then a two-note rise, followed by a daub of pastel color in the middle register, a warm third interval that arrives like a soft benediction or a kept promise. In typical Mahler fashion, the musical statement is unfolding before our very ears. A long-limbed melody, first parsed as two notes, then three, then four, slowly gaining expressive momentum, tempting the ear ever forward. And then at the close, while the drummer boy and tambour gazelle trudged off resignedly to his fate, the anonymous recluse in Ich bin der Welt abhanden gekommen concludes a determined motion towards spiritual retreat, a paradoxically steadfast move toward withdrawal. I am dead to the world's tumult and rest in a quiet realm. I live alone in my heaven, in my love, in my song. So Ich bin der Welt abhanden gekommen is probably Mahler's most exquisite song of all, but at the same time among his simplest musical statements. Mahler suggests otherworldliness in his song with his slow rhythmic stability. The score direction here is extremely slowly and hesitatingly, hesitatingly indicating character and not rhythm here. The text actually deals more than anything in inhibition and this must have been a real challenge, a great challenge for him to realize musically more so than introversion. The text here now communicates some measure of apology. Ich kann auch gar nichts sagen dagegen, uh, nor can I deny it. Um, so kind of an apology for, for what, is, uh, what is being voiced here. So the writer and the singer uh, do not discourage, discourage the conclusion that reclusiveness, though it becomes the poet's salvation, is also an ungenerous inclination to our fellow humans. And you can hear the sense of inhibition, perhaps, in the rather hazy intervals of the song, the many major sevenths, the major sixths. One last detail before we hear it. Uh, glissando and portamento are important features of Mahler's melodies. Uh, in all his symphonies, uh, this sliding from one note to the next. It epitomizes his songfulness, his sense of line, and his taste for rapture, a reluctance to leave the present moment behind. Near the end of Ich bin der Welt, uh, actually in the last, uh, after the singer is finished, um, we find an intriguing example of Mahler using such a portamento in the instrumental postlude to this song. The implication is that words are superseded by action born of sheer emotion. The long-awaited otherworldly place has been named as the quiet realm, the transcendent destination. And whether that is heaven or whether that is art remains ultimately, I suppose, unimportant. So this slide, uh, you can hear it in the orchestral version where Mahler gives it to a violin slide up to a delicious tonic ninth chord. With the pianist, uh, again, this happens toward the very end. We'll have to, I suppose, just imagine this blissful slide 
uh, as we watch Jiyong's uh, right hand leap up uh, and places uh, pinky uh, up on the uh, ninth degree of the scale. So now, uh, please, ich bin der Welt abhanden gekommen.
<laughs> sorry, a few more words here. Um, it feels profane even to speak after this wonderful music, but I'll do it anyway. Um, <laughs> it's a gorgeous song, it's a beautiful song. It's also a confusing song, despite the fact, as I say, in addition to the fact that there is no, no character here, no time. You probably notice that there are no strong cadences anywhere in this song. And this seems part of a basic and gentle emotional confusion that's going on here, one that might point to potential problems in Mahler's fusion of the text-based genre of the song with the instrumental genre of the symphony, the specific and the non-specific. Ich bin der Welt gekommen, if you ignore its text, sounds for all the world like a romantic love song. I've actually located four love texts that would fit very well with its metrics and its ethos. But Rugert's words here are not really about love, they're about isolation, which is something very different from love. So a hearing of the song leaves us wondering, how can a person love in seclusion? If that is a contradiction, what is the song's real message? Mahler's song does specifically mention love at the end, but this is not a personal love, this is a kind of salvation that comes from not from flying into someone's arms, but with retreating into art and beauty and aesthetic comforts. One other strange thing considering the tone of the song is that the text mentions death multiple times, which is also strange for a song that's about either love or retreat. And yet the song, of course, is very far from being dark or deathly or funereal. And here I'll uh, get a little personal and offer a personal confession uh, that over these recent stressful years, which the type we've all been having, I've often myself fantasized about sublimating into some kind of atomized, floating, superhuman state. A state that is suffused with perhaps the peace of death, but also the cognizance and the pleasures of life. I've worked at transporting myself psychically in this way in a fashion that might be close to what uh, people have described to me as meditation. Political strife, racial injustice, deaths of close relatives, and grievous pandemics uh, tend to do, can do such things to us. We live in turbulent, unjust, and maybe worst of all, deeply brutal and cynical times. The fortunate ones among us have been living as if in a time of war, but quietly sequestered far back from the front lines of battle. We've been living in confusing times that demand social activism at the same time they've spawned pandemics requiring us to practice this wonderful oxymoron of social distancing, uh, to be alone in our own worlds. So what use can all this music be in such a difficult time? A song won't deflect a bullet, a song won't purge a dangerous virus from a person that won't feed a child. How can we be part of the world in order to better it, but also stay apart from that world for sake of survival? In such a world, Mahler's Ich bin der Welt seems like an invitation to habitate mindfully elsewhere, if only for a few moments. It invites us to drop our survivor's guilt and believe in life. Over these past few years, if I happen to be a singer, God help us all, um, You'd surely have found me singing this song uh, to myself in darker moments alone, in darker moments of our darkened times. While Mahler's earlier epic narrative songs can offer the relief of catharsis, moving in thrall to severe emotions only to expunge them, his later lyric songs like Ich bin der Welt can become a roadmap, a musical, spiritual, sonic plan for escape from a time that positively challenges us to survive. People commonly say that Mahler's music carries a sense of humanity, and that's surely where the truest center of this lyric sensibility resides. I'd also say Mahler's work can allow listeners to better know themselves. I can't imagine anyone engaging with these five Rickert songs and then failing to give their hearts over to charity and tenderness, or at the very least not finding a renewed, in, a renewed ability to listen and the world can always use more good listeners. So if I may offer by way of conclusion, let us listen, let us listen even further, and then let us be kind to each other and to ourselves and go forth and do good.
Thank you very much.